Okay, thank you again for the introduction. So we will be talking about this IPv6. Uh, many people assume it's more secure than IPv4, but I put really here in a question mark in uppercase. Agenda. Uh, from the, the rest of the topic of today and tomorrow, it looks like it's most of the attendees and the speakers are more in the application world. So I will redo a quick intro, introducing the network issue with IPv6 and a few words as well in, in Poland and the rest of the world. I will talk then about some IPv6, what I call security myth, uh, notably where is my NAT? Because everyone knows that network address translation is a key security feature, right? Uh, let me laugh on this. We talk as well again on the layer two, and as you wrote, read, uh, I, I wrote a book there on layer two security many years ago on IPv4 and IPv6. The issue is that layer two is often the weak layer because people do not pay attention to it. It assumes for granted. Something which is pretty cool in IPv6, that something called extension headers. And the name was of course to extend IPv6 features, but as we are security practitioner, we know as well extensibility mean more bugs, and indeed they were. And time permitting, a few words about forensic uh, that are not identical in IPv4 and IPv6. So what's in IPv6? This slide basically summarizes the high-level message about what is IPv6. You remember IPv4, or still used everywhere, obviously mostly everywhere, as an issue, 32 bits of addresses. So it means two to the power of 32 addresses, meaning about 4 billion. We are 7 billion on the earth. And obviously we need more IPv4 address per person, right? Your watch, your tablet, your phone, your laptop, and so on. So we need again to get a bigger address space. So IPv6 is pretty much like IPv4. Uh, it's what we call a connectionless IP layer. Uh, but with 128 bits addresses. Those 128 bits are split in two. That is something to remember. 64 bit, what we call the network prefix or the subnet, basically identifying a unique VLAN or wireless LAN or LAN. And 64 bits for what's called interface ID, uh, which basically is the host, allowing, of course, to, to the power of 64 nodes per LAN, which is a huge amount, of course. Good news, all the transport layers are unchanged. This is the same TCP as you know, the same UDP as you know, and so on. Data link layers as, as well are unchanged. This is still Ethernet, this is still Wi-Fi, this is still PPP over Ethernet. The only thing is that in the IoT world, they have ported IPv6, for instance, on LAN1 or Sixfox, but only IPv6, not IPv4. In blue, at the bottom, this is the key differentiator, security-wise, between v4 and v6. The mapping of an IPv6 address to a data link, to a MAC address, or Ethernet address, has been completely rebuilt from scratch. This is called neighbor discovery protocol. Rebuilt from scratch means introducing new bugs, of course. And it's extensible, right? We can add extension headers. And the way we deploy IPv6, is typically what we call dual stack. And all our network right now are basically dual stack. It means that when an application sends packets over TCP on UDP, the network layer in gray, uh, it's either IPv4 or IPv6, typically a choice of the application or the operating system. And those packets are sent over the same data link, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or whatever, because Every receiver, switch, router, whatever, can make the difference. In all Ethernet or Wi-Fi frames, there is what you call a protocol ID, and there are two values, 800 or 86DD, that can allow the differentiation between V4 and V6, meaning all your laptops or phones are basically sending those two kinds of packets. Address representation, I will skip most of this slide. It's basically in hexadecimal. Uh, so that's interesting because you have letters in IP address now. And we, of course, have a huge amount of zeros there. And we typically uh, remove them and we compress them. But that's a kind of a detail. The interface ID in the range for the 64-bit, which I put on the right, the least significant one, like in IPv4. At the beginning, it was reusing 
the 48 bits of your MAC address, of your Ethernet interface. And of course, as this Ethernet interface was not changing, now it's changing, right? Um, thanks to uh, iOS and, and Android. But typically, the MAC address was not changing. So your interface ID was kept the same, whether you were in the office or in the university or in a plane or whatever, allowing um, some privacy leak, of course, because even if the left-hand part was changing, because that's the network identification, the interface ID itself was not changing. So we can track you. So years ago, privacy was already very important. So this interface ID has now been replaced for many, many years by a random number, which is changing every day. Or in the some case, for instance, in iOS, it's changing every time your iPad or your iPhone uh, comes to life again. So interesting. Extension headers. We will talk more on this later. A typical packet, right, is on the left. In gray here, what do you have? There's the IPv6 header with a destination and source address, pretty much like IPv4, not a big change. And if you want to have a TCP header somewhere, because you are transporting SSH, let's say, you put there a six. The six is the number that when somebody receives an IPv6 packet, or an IPv4, by the way, he knows the rest here is TCP. It was in 17, for instance, for UDP. Now, what we do in IPv6 is that between the gray IPv6 header, and in this case, I've used a UDP just to make a change at the bottom, we can insert in blue another extension header. In this case, routing header, basically to do some uh, segment routing or source routing. And now look, the next header PLE is 43. That's the number for routing header. And here they also have a space of one byte telling it the next after me is 17. That's for UDP. And you can change them, right? For instance, here on the right, I see like 43. That's a routing header. But now I put here 60 because here I got another one, a purple one, and so on. You can have a very, very large extension header chain. And of course, each uh, extension header has got its own length, right? So we know where to point after. Basically, that's cool, right? Because we keep improving and adding features to IPv6. Very recently, for instance, there was the segment routing for IPv6, or as well, network programming, where you can send forwarding instruction or routing instruction inside the packets. So basically, that's the packets that decide where, what kind of processing, and what kind of path it wants to have. Interesting. But of course, more flexibility, more bugs introduced in new code, and maybe too much of flexibility, time will tell. Quick view on what is the IPv6 deployment. Um, the greener, the better. Uh, we can see it's mainly US and, and Canada. Uh, a lot of India, mainly around mobile. I mean, most of the mobile operators in India are providing phones with IPv6 only, which is quite interesting. Uh, Europe is quite green. It, it really varies from country to country. And if you look about worldwide, that's the number of connection going to any Google properties. So Google, of course, but Gmail, YouTube, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and so on. Oh, sorry, forget about Facebook, of course, that's only Google. Uh, you see here, I, I took the numbers yesterday, we have about one big third of the people using Google properties going to Google over IPv6. So that's quite impressive. And again, it depends upon the country. Uh, my own country, we have about 55, 60% of the user using a PV6 daily, I mean, without knowing, basically. Now, the thing is that if we go to Poland, for instance, I'm afraid it's not too, too good, right? So if you look about the, the curve on the right, again, taken a couple of days uh, from now, um, it's around 10%. Uh, I don't know why, um, but it's, it's the fact. Now, if you want to look about which service provider in Poland is the most using IPv6. We can see 
UPC, so most probably a cable modem company, where it's very easy for them to move to a PV6 and TPNet. Uh, but others are pretty much uh, less common here. Anyway, quick 10 minute introduction to a PV6. Let's go to the security. And myth. One myth is that IPv6 is newer, right? It's more than 20 years old, right, by the way. So if it's new like the car, we want to get it faster, better, and more secure. The car on the left is, of course, more secure because it's got ABS, uh, safety belts, and so on. But is it always the case that something new is better and more secure? Those two pilots, there is an old one, by the way, it's me on the rented plane, and the right one, which is, of course, the Photoshop. Which pilot do you think is the more secure? Which pilot provides the more safety to you? Experience means a lot. So my point is that when we deploy IPv6, for the few months, the time it takes to your network team, your security team, to understand it and be able to apply security to it will take time. So for a while, it's a little bit less secure, right, obviously. We are human beings. Another myth, the subnet. Each and every LAN or VLAN, right, has two to the power of 64 addresses. If you, an attacker wants to make a reconnaissance, so you need to scan and discover which IPv6 address exists in your network. Even if it's sending 10 million packets per second, it takes 50,000 years. And guess what, right? First, with the privacy extension, the IPv6 addresses will change every day. So pretty useless. And I'm afraid in 50,000 years, right, uh, we will be using IPv11 uh, or whatever. And I'm afraid I won't be there anymore on Earth, right? So uh, people believe that, oh, security by obscurity, I cannot be found, so I'm safe. We all know, of course, that security by obscurity is just a dream. I mean, there are, I will not go through all the reasons here, but people can still find you. I mean, if you have a valuable information or a valuable service like an IP phone or a SIP proxy or a web server or whatever, or even a, a streaming server or peer to peer file sharing, somebody needs to find you. For instance, you will put your name, your fully qualified domain name, your DNS name into the DNS systems. So to do the mapping. So now rather than trying all the IPv6 addresses, you can try a.pl, b.pl, and so on, z.pl, aa.pl, you got it, right? And there are ways to improve it on the performance side and many others. Now, if you do a trace route, uh, obviously you will discover all the intermediate routers, IPv6 addresses, right? So, and so on and so on. So very easy to do. Another big question is not. With the huge amount of IPv6 addresses, the IETF has not really specified a way to do NAT for IPv6. And my router at home is not doing NAT for IPv6. It's doing it for IPv4, obviously. And that's quite often the case. So you do not need a NAT. And then people sometimes tell to me, hey, Eric, where is my NAT? It's unsecure if I don't do NAT. And I hope that I don't need to convince you that it's plain wrong, right? There are many ways uh, to, to bypass that. And anyway, nowadays, right? So the attack are no more coming from the outside trying to penetrate on your server or your client. It's more your server that is fetching something wrong out of the internet. So, and again, don't con confuse the NAT and the security provided by a firewall. And again, between quote, they are quite often collocated for IPv4 because it's cheaper, but the two functions are different. You may want to keep the firewall for IPv6, of course, but no need to do the NAT. Even more important, right? If you look about the date, 2009, at that point of time, already somebody cracked into the command and control channel from a botnet or topic, and they were able to collect 
all the local IPv4 addresses. And if you look about it, about 80% were basically coming from network 10, 12, 168, basically all the NAT address. So for 80% of the botnet members, they were protected between quotes by a NAT function. In short, they were not protected, obviously. And Steintorp Janasson, uh, we talked to you uh, later today, it's an ex colleague of mine and, and a good friend. He discovered uh, in 2017, a way to even scan IoT device behind the NAT. It was basically a two-stage, a malware, a Trojan that you download somewhere, install on your laptop to behind the NAT protection, and then this malware basically scans for IoT device, could have been for everything, right? But in this specific case, it was IoT. Scan for IoT device and use the Mirai uh, bot code to basically inject and compromise those IoT devices that were behind a net. And by the way, with this, many IoT devices support IPv6 as well, specifically industrial ones, just because you need to get more addresses. So even if you have an IPv4 only network, you can download the same kind of multi-stage. The Trojan will scan over V6 by using techniques, again, not the normal scanning as we have seen before. Discover IPv6 device and attack your IoT device over IPv6, right? You have two doors open. And many, many attacks um, are pretty much similar between IPv6 and IPv4. And that's good, right? It means that this, you need to experiment and gain experience, of course. But many good old tricks still work. I mean, or attacks. You can sniff traffic, right? If it's not protected by TLS or Quick, you can still see what's inside. Application layer attacks, they are the same. And most of the attacks nowadays, and the previous speaker was again an attack over um, the application. Guess what? Whether it's a PV4, PV6, you don't care, right? Because you run this attack like cross site scripting over HTTP, over TCP, and you don't care if it's a PV4 and a PV6. All the attack tools for cross site scripting, SQL injection, or whatever, uh, works perfectly fine as well uh, over V6. Uh, rogue device, rogue access point, flooding the DOS is the same. Just one thing though come back on the application layer attack. For me, it also means that every IPS, uh, application firewall, next generation firewall, name it, whatever you want, but a lot of protection against application attacks works perfectly fine for IPv4 and IPv6. So for instance, my own employer, Cisco, we had IPS device. It was mostly the simple product to port from IPv4 to IPv6 because we simply need to change one bottom layer. And all the vast majority of the signature, 99% or so, were on the application layer and they were working day one, which is quite cool. Okay, now let's go in the topic when I said the layer two security, the wireless LAN, the VLAN or the LAN security. Just one point here, in 98, this is when the IPv6 specification was specified, right? Tw 23 years ago. And if you remember, if you're old enough, in 2000, this was this NISNIFS package, which was basically doing app spoofing and basically attacking the layer two. Guess what? Do you think that in 98, people were aware of those attacks against IPv4? Do you think that in 98, two years before DSNIF, they were specifying the protocol to resist attack similar to our spoofing? Of course not. And remember, right? Networks and the, the services are basically sun castle, right? You have on the big tower, this is basically your service, your data. Um, you try to put some kind of a firewall somewhere, but all of this castle is basically relying on the layer two, right? The small piece of sand below and you know where the attacker is right 
I guess all of us have gone to the seashore and been this, and we know we are always losing. My point here is that we need to build a very strong layer two. So what's happening in IPv6? There is something called SLAP, stateless address auto configuration. And there's something which is pretty cool. An IPv6 node on the left, being a phone or a laptop or a desktop, do not need to have a DHCP v6 server. It's enough to have a router. This is the router here. And then the PC or whatever the node is sending router solicitation. And it does it every 30 seconds or so until you got a reply. So your phones, even if you are on an IPv4 only network, is trained every 30 seconds or so, right? Router solicitation. Is there an IPv6 router? When there is an IPv6 router, he replied to the router advertisement array. In this array, there is in red here the prefix, the leading 64 bits identifying the network. Now, the PC on the left can run its random number generator, get the 64 bit for the privacy address, 64 prefix, 64 interface ID, it makes 128 bits. Now, the PC on the left is a valid IPv6 address. You obviously know the MAC address of the router because it's also contained into the router advertisement. And then you can go to the internet. Really cool, right? Because you don't need the HTTP server. Uh, it works like a charm. A router advertisement also sent by routers every minute multicasted. So all the phones and tablets receive it. And you can configure a vast network with 20,000 nodes, for instance, in a single packet. So it's really, really impressive, honestly. But this router advertisement has been designed in 98. So no security, right? Same level of security as DHCP before, meaning none. So now a bad guy can come. This is the guy, the black hat, obviously, sending a rogue, a wrong router advertisement. Then the PC on the left will believe, hey, I'm using this router because in the router advertisement, there is also the priority. So we can say the bad guy with the highest priority. Then, of course, you know the story, right? So you are on the on an on path attacker. So you can run a, a DOS attack or you can basically do uh, on path attack and change and modify. Obviously, we need to fix this. Uh, it has been fixed uh, with an um, RFC at the ATF called ArrayGuard. And basically, it leveraged the knowledge of the network operator. Network operators know where the router is in its network, for instance, the uplink of an access point, and where the clients, non router, are, for instance, on the Wi Fi uh, side of an access point. No, you can configure a regard. Don't pay too much attention on the left. This is for Cisco device, but that's not the point here. When the router sends a router advertisement, the device here is an access point of, oh, that's my uplink. I know you are the good guy. I can forward and multicast your router advertisement to everyone so they can configure themselves. Now, the bad guy, again, the black hat, is sending the rogue array. Yeah, by the access point, oh, you are on the wireless side of the access point. You cannot send array, so I'm blocking it. Very, very simple, isn't it? And the, the good thing is that we can recognize which packets are a router advertisement simply because that's an IPv6 packet, an ICMP, so control my, uh, protocol, with a specific operation code. So that's kind of easy to do it. But stay tuned, because fragmentation is coming. Uh, we have um, another protocol, which is called, um, in this case, a neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement. This is when station A um, wants to talk to station B, but he knows the IPv6 address of station B, it doesn't know this MAC address. So it's sending basically on this packet here, it's sending a neighbor solicitation, multicast it again, with using this IPv6 address B, and then B replies 
with a neighbor advertisement, and we are all good. It's exactly like the IPv4 app. It's basically, they are also robotitious app associated um, neighbor advertisement. So the fact is that last come, the last neighbor advertisement is used by default, by every host. Annoying, of course, right? We know about our spoofing. So we do the same thing uh, in network device because typically you can trust routers, switches, and access point, and usually you don't trust endpoints. That's the premises of all of this. So we put three hosts here, and the guy in the middle here will try to build up a binding table. So basically mapping the address, the MAC address, the IPv6 address, the VLAN and the interface. That's what we call in IPv4 DHCP snooping. Um, not always using DHCP anymore, right, in IPv6. It exists, but most of the hosts uh, do uh, Slack. You remember? Router advertisement, and then they're configured. So when H1 got a Slack address, he will need to do that. That stands for duplicate address detection. He need to check, of course, whether somebody else wants to use the address A1 that he wants to use. How is it done? He simply send a neighbor to citation for itself. Normally, nobody should reply, right? If nobody's using his address, he will get no reply. Then, when the switch in the middle here receives it, it can enter the binding between address A1, the MAC address H1, and the VLAN and the interface. Host H2 is using the HTTP, so that's easy, right? It's sending a DHCP request, the DHCP server replies. Only difference, and you notice here, right? He has two IPv6 address, because here, the DHCP server was replying with two IPv6 address, which is unusual, but it's the same thing, right? So we know we can put it in the table. Now, we may want to get something else. Host H3 um, is a very long host uh, that has been there for years, but was never talking. So there is no entry in the table. So when I receive an actual data packet, so no DHCP, no that, uh, what can I do? There are two technologies, and both of them can work together, of course. In DHCP v6, there is something called least query, where, of course, a trusted device can ask the DHCP server, hey, can you provide me the binding for this MAC address and those addresses? And then it reply, of course, the DHCP server. And then you can get the mapping. Or what you do, the switch can simply say, hey, who is using address A3? So, the IPv6 address of the host three. And normally, it should get only one reply, the normal one. And if you got two reply, it means that there is a normal one and a bad one. And of course, now he doesn't know which one is it, which one, but at least he can block the traffic of everything. Other issue, and then we will stop about those layer two, um, is what we call the remote neighbor cache exhaustion. That's an attack that can be done from remote. Because obviously, I forgot to say it, but the rogue route advertisement or the rogue neighbor advertisement are local, right? They are only multicasted within a single wireless LAN or single VLAN. This attack is remote. So if a bad guy is sending ping packets to multiple IPv6 address, like in this case, one, two, three, the router at the destination network we need to know, hey, I, I got the ping packets, I need to send it to the destination, but I don't know the MAC address. So what can I do? I, I'm doing neighbor solicitation, right? I try to discover normally who is using those V6 address. Most of the time, no reply. He asks a second time, again, no reply because those addresses are non-existent, and a third time, and then he stops. But it means, that the memory of the router and the CPU spent basically to send those packets are used. In the case of an IPv4 network, you simply have a slash 24, so you have only uh, two to the power eight addresses per VLAN, so typically uh, 256. Even in large, large 
A wireless LAN is maybe 65,000, but no more. In the case of an IPv6 network, you can have billions and billions and billions of addresses. So your memory here can grow very high, and that's a loss. Obviously, uh, every vendors and routers has got mechanisms to protect against this. Right, we limit simply the numbers of entries and we are safe. But you see that basically a very simple design uh, can be compromised in multiple ways. Okay, next step will be extension headers. And I will ultra quickly introduce SCAPI, uh, mainly to give you the taste of it. SCAPI is a Python library, um, maybe some of you know, as well as a, like an interpreter to build very specific packets. It's very, very useful. It's quite an old tool. Uh, I use it, my, I was writing my book about 10 years ago. Um, very powerful, very complex to use. Um, this slide basically can provide you with some explanation, but basically you can build your packets on your own and you can send them and receive them. Again, no time to go through all the details here. So let's use CAPI to play somehow with extension headers. So I'm trying here to build an IPv6 packet, says the syntax here, with an extension header hop by hop, followed by one with a decision option, a routing header, another hop by hop, and then followed by it, and so on and so on. And finally, I end up with a TCP header. And I, in the end, I send it. Then what? Of course, Wireshark or TCP dump can receive it. But for instance, look at this. Normally, you can have only one hop by hop extension address. I put two here. Or destination option is maximum two. I am sending it three. I mean, we are security people. We know before overflow exists. And if they are on the stack, this is quite critical. And guess what? Some very naive implementation where accepting three, four edition header, but putting it after one of the other, crashing the stack, of course. Very a lot of boundary condition. It's not only about the action header itself, because action header contains options, and those options can also be larger or smaller, and so many boundary condition. So there were a lot of um, issue there, and there are also a few things there. So the good thing, you may want to use a firewall that enforces the right order of these headers and the amount of them. Um, most of the time nowadays, in 2021, the OSTAC, whether it's Linux, Windows, or whatever, are pretty immune to this. But we still see somewhere in a very strange device, device that when you see there are very weird packets, they simply crash. Yeah, not good, it's simply. Extension headers as well pose a problem if you want to do access control list based on TCP ports, for instance, or if you want to analyze what's in an HTTP header or an HTTP content. In IPv4, it's easy, right? You have 20 bytes of the IPv4 header, then you get 20 bytes again for the TCP header, and you always know where the ports are. And after TCP, it was HTTP, for instance. Very easy. Now, in IPv6, you have the 40 bytes with a slider, right? IPv6 header, you still have the 20 bytes TCP. But these very valid packets can have an extension header hop by hop, a routing, authentication header, that's IPsec, and some data behind. But of course, we know the length of the IPv6 header. In the first two few bytes of the hop by hop, they say the length, so we know where to start the routing. Right, and the routing, the length is also there, so we know that the next one is here. In AH, we know the length, we can go there. TCP is, of course, always 20 bytes, so that's easy. So basically, everyone can pass this. Being the host, being a server, being a switch, being a router, being a firewall, that's perfectly easy. There is a performance impact, of course, right, because you need to do it. And on some hardware platform like ultra speed uh, layer three switches, uh, you have the lookup window 
is typically 128 bits, bytes, sorry, or 256 bytes. So if you have an extension at the chain, as we say, which is longer than this, they cannot find the TCP uh, because they only look for going very fast in, let's say, the first 128 bytes. And it varies based on the vendor, the platforms, and so on. Yeah, not easy to know. Fragment. Yes. In IPv6, you also need to fragment being packets on a smaller packet if the maximum transmission unit, the MTU of a link, is smaller. Uh, typical link, uh, for instance, on Ethernet is 1,500 bytes. But sometimes you have Jumbo frames of 9,000 9, bytes. So you need two fragments. Uh, there is a minor difference in IPv6 is that the fragmentation is done only by the end system, so that's the source. Um, we have also known for many years that fragments can overlap, basically to escape firewalls or stateless IPS or confuse uh, some hosts and, and servers. The RFC for IPv6 forbids this, so we cannot get fragments that are overlapping. They need really to be just touching each other, adjacent. Uh, and it's been there since uh, many years, about 10 years now. That's cool. And we know, of course, that fragmentation has been used by attackers in the IPv4 world. Um, as I said, right, just to confuse network inclusion, um, specifically stateless firewall, um, because they cannot, like, do not have any state, right? So they do not remember the previous uh, fragments. Um, again, pretty old attack, 98, same time as the IPv6 standards has been issued by the ATF. So all of this works as well for IPv6. But with IPv6 and the extension header chain, we've got something more that does not really exist in IPv4. And it's, of course, for stateless filters, right? Basically, for routers or literary switches, not firewall, that simply wants to protect, let's say, some SSH traffic or obtain that traffic and block them or allow them. So we have here two fragments. And of course, it's TCP, right? And some data behind it. The two fragments have all of them the same IPv6 header, the same op by op needs to be repeated. Uh, let's say in this case, I was using some routing. We have in blue the fragment header that basically signal A. Uh, after me, that's a fragment, so you need to do reassembly. Uh, the value here are different, right? Because in fragment one, it says the length of the orange. <clears throat> and in fragment two, it says the length of the complete rest, right? So all of this. Remember how it's done now. The length of the orange destination header, which has been fragmented because it was too large, right? And we can cut it in two. So it was cut in two pieces, in two fragments. The length of the complete range is there in the first few bytes. TCP after. The number six for TCP is somewhere here. So when a stateless firewall receives this, he knows for sure that, OK, I know after the TCP, but uh, I don't have it. The stateless firewall forgets about everything, right? You receive the second fragment, this one. Then you can pass this, as we have seen. Yes, I know the length, I know the length. OK, uh, fragment two. Uh, but I don't know it's TCP after, and I don't know the length of the arrange. He can do nothing, right? He can simply do nothing. So either he allows all the fragments, or he blocks all the fragments. That's all he can do. He doesn't have the granularity to filter anymore on TCP ports or UDP ports. Kind of annoying. So one of the biggest issue was about this Arega. You remember blocking packets coming from the wireless hack side that are route advertisement, in this case, rogue route advertisement. So there is an RFC that says, A, nodes receiving a fragmented NDP should discard it. Because, of course, the attacker could run, send a rogue array, fragment it so that the, the wireless access point cannot find whether it's an array or something else. So 
that's the issue. And most important, since two years now, the second revision of the PVC standards, this RSC 8200, says if the first fragment does not include whole headers through an upper layer, so TCP or DP, then that fragment should be discarded. Meaning that host, router, or whatever, when they see this, right, without any TCP here, they need to drop it, protecting against it. Again, good news. Nowadays, uh, most recent operating systems uh, uh, apply this specification. If you want to play at home with this, I have prepared a quick SCAPI um, for sending a connecting to 22, uh, which is basically um, SSH, and you see NTCP. There's the two fragments. You see that on the first fragment, we have the TCP, there's the six, and 22 decimal is actually 16, and the hexadecimal is in the second fragment. And I was using TCP dump to dump the packets. And even TCP dump, which is stateless, was unable to understand it's a SSH. So I have run this through um, a router with a very naive um, access control list, trying to block everything, which is 22. And we've seen that on TCP dump here, it was receiving the two fragments. Linux, in this case, was doing the reassembly, putting the two fragments together. Oh, it's TCP 22. And then basically, I'm replying indeed here to my attacker on port 22 because I'm the server to the gentleman here. OK, we can go. So basically, bypassing all of the access control list. Again, stateless, right? If you have a stateful firewall, that's no problem. If you have a personal firewall on your like uh, IP tables or a security center, everything is fine. Um, it's, it's kind of OK right now. So. They are, I put it in gray, uh, another workaround if you don't use uh, recent operating systems. And now, what should we do with those extension headers? Because nowadays, when you are an edge firewall, you need to understand not only which protocol do I allow, which port, you also need to, allow, to check whether I am allowing this extension headers, yes or no. And what I want to use is advice to you is a permit only, right? Don't allow by default, only permit the extension headers that you want to go through, um, like fragmentation, maybe or not. Uh, typically, you will most probably allow IPsec, so AH and ESP, which are extension headers, uh, needs to be allowed, and so on. There are also another issue with service provider, your own service provider sometimes blocks for one unknown reason, extension headers. So if there are any uh, ISP in this audience, please don't block extension headers because you are blocking uh, the internet to the stage where it is right now. So we should allow them on the traffic transit, right? Not the traffic to your DNS server or your web servers or whatever. So time is flying, I uh, will simply jump to the key takeaway. Something which is cool with IPv6, there are a lot of things that are similar. As I said in the one slide introduction, IPv6 is connectionless like IPv4. Um, we have, of course, extension headers, which is uh, annoying, uh, but you need to put a policy for this, as we've seen. Fragmentation is more complex, but it's mostly uh, and uh, right now, land security, yeah, uh, spoofing is still there. It's called neighborly scooby spoofing, it's called raw array. So, think about it again. We cannot enable by default all those security measures like array guard because some it really depends upon your settings. So, you need to do it your own. Capi, I provided you with examples, is really important. Um, as I said, if you remember the baby uh, pilot and the older pilot, training is important. You are in security, so check with your network department whether they have plans for deploying a PVC and then apply security before deployment, right? Don't apply security after. We cannot make this mistake. Something I forgot to mention is that IPv6 is there in your network, right? The IPv6 doesn't need to have a router for doing v6 or a connection to doing a pv6 to the internet 
as soon as you get host, phones, tablets doing V6, meaning all of them, right? Linux, Mac OS, whatever. It's enough because they can talk IPv6 to each other. So a local host can attack other local host on the same LAN uh, over IPv6, even if your network department believes there is no V6 there, right? So it means that all your security measure uh, needs to be done for IPv6, even if you do not plan to move to IPv6. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I try to put as many things as I can in the 45 minutes. So thank you for your attention.